Our next speaker is Sarah Morley. Uh, Sarah is a curator, research and discovery at the State Library of New South Wales. She works closely with manuscript and rare book collections, drawing on her experience in collection acquisition, arrangement and description. To coincide with Jonathan Jones's Barangal Dayara installation in 2016, Sarah curated a display on the Garden Palace in the Library's Amaze Gallery. She also writes for the Library's SL magazine, and Sarah has a passion for libraries, the history of the book, and interpretations of Australia from the earliest records to the present day. Uh, she will be speaking on the Sir Joseph Banks papers online, and we were saying in the break that these were the first digitised things I'd ever seen back in the 90s, so she'll give us an update on what they've been doing, whether Joseph Banks have created any new ones since. Welcome, Sarah. It's the last session of the day, so thank you for still being here and thank you for picking our session. We really appreciate your presence. Um, as, um, before I start, I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the um, Wajak Nyunga people. Um, as we share our knowledge, our learning and our research um, today, let's not forget all of the knowledge embedded in the country in which, which we're meeting. As John mentioned, I'd like to talk about um, a recent project at the State Library of New South Wales. Um, it's to improve the access and discoverabil discoverability of our Sir Joseph Banks papers, um, reimagining it in a website um, as opposed to the catalogue. Um, so someone raised yesterday in Mike Jones's talk, I'm not sure if any, any of you saw it, it was at the end and, and um, someone raised that idea of hierarchies and were they necessary and was there some alternative and the, I, I don't think there is, um, especially with significant collections and large manuscript collections such as this. But I do think that we need to think of creative alternatives to, um, to deliver these, um, these complex collections and make, help our researchers to make inroads and make them far more accessible, um, make it easier to interrogate these collections. So before I go any further, I do want to make a disclosure that I am not an archivist. Um, I have worked... <laughs> I have worked quite, quite closely with our manuscript collections, but I am a librarian, a trained librarian. I am working as a curator. Um, so with that in mind, um, this project is in, um, in the context of a library environment. We collect published materials. We provide access to those published materials. We, provide, we collect original material as well as uh, archival material. Same thing. Um, so we're operating in a hybrid environment and I guess coming to conferences such as these, that's where I, I sort of feel like a little bit of an imposter or despite us providing access to these enormous archival collections, it's, it's not in, the, in a sense that it's record management. It's a sort of a, we're sort of running that gauntlet between in, providing access to the archives through our catalogues which do have archival standards and um, but the record structure is different and how, how, we, um, how we deliver those is a bit of a challenge. So um, I'll go into my slide now. <laughs> Um, so we provide access through our catalogue, um, through Primo. Now this is the discovery layer that we provide access to our archival collections um, through Adlib and our printed or published collections through Alma. Um, it's, it's improving, um, but it's, it's very difficult because it's hard for us to reflect those archival structures in um, Primo. It just doesn't cope with it. We're working on that. Um, and Adlib, this is what you get at the bottom of a, of a record, um, and that's okay for smaller collections, but for our larger collections, it's, it's a veritable nightmare. Um, so um, it's one of our larger, the Banks Papers is one of our larger manuscript collections, and it is a challenge to reflect these complex um, hierarchies, and a particular one of ours, as I've said, is using an off-the-shelf product um, and how we provide um, serendipitous discovery. Um, although we've got it, the strong search features, it's about the browse factor, and, and this is almost impenetrable. So I'll give you a bit of a background to the collection before I move into the project. Um, when Sir Joseph Banks died, 
He, um, he died in 1820. He left behind a well-organised archive which documented his influential career. It was one of the most comprehensive archives of its time in the UK at the time. Um, and in the 1880s, um, Banks's descendant, Lord Brabourne, decided to um, sell off um, the Banks papers to make a bit of money. So they were bought, some of those, our collection, was bought in 1884 by Sir Saul Samuels, who was the Agent General for New South Wales at the time. Now, um, they were ultimately transferred to the Mitchell Library in 1910, um, and they became part of the acquisition known as the Brabourne Papers. So that provided, for, for a number of years, that was complicated for the library because they were known as the Brabourne Papers rather than the Banks Papers, which, which they are rightly known as now. So um, I should clarify that not everything was purchased. Not all of the Banks Papers were purchased by, um, by Sir Saul Samuels for, for the state of New South Wales. Um, the collections were dispersed throughout the world and they're in over 50 significant parts, um, have been identified in over 50 collections around the world. Um, now, we used a list um, that was in H.B. Carter's Sir Joseph Banks' Guide to Biographical and Bibliographical Sources. Um, as part of the project, I tried to track down as many of those collections um, in their archives. Now, some of those archives don't exist anymore. Some have moved. Um, some I found um, but couldn't provide a permanent link to. So where that wasn't possible, I've tried to link to directly to the records in those institutions. Where that wasn't possible, it's just to the ar archive itself. Um, so thankfully, David Scott Mitchell, um, who is the library's main benefactor, purchased the Endeavour Journal, which was um, sold off separately, um, but um, Mitchell bought it from another Australian collector, Alfred Lee. So that was a nice little synergy that ultimately, that's an extra part that has ended up back together where it should be. Um, so the papers didn't come to the library um, immediately. They were used for a number of publications, and as part of that publication process, they were reorganised and annotated. An archivist's worst nightmare, really. Um, but the, the collection exclusive of the Endeavour Journal comprises um, 742 manuscript pages, um, which includes manuscripts, uh, correspondence, uh, primarily um, letters received by banks, um, reports, invoices, um, accounts, and there are a small number of maps, charts, and watercolours as well. So a bit on the structure of of the archive, it's, it's huge. Um, in the 1990s, as John said, um, the library embarked on a project um, to digitise the bank's papers. Now that was digitised from microfilm. So it was a, a really innovative project at the time, quite cutting edge, and it was, I think, possibly the library's first digitisation project. Um, as you can see, it was 19 sections. Um, we arrange them into this, this structure um, based on um, reflecting Banks' activities and interests. Um, it's 90, 19 sections, 95 series, and that comprises 2,294 documents, um, and including the Endeavour Journal, 8,943 pages. So that's what, what we're, the numbers that we're dealing with as, as I move forward. So they were rearranged to uh, reflect as far as possible the way that they were used. And now um, Banks used this archive and he, people used to go and visit him and use his archive and use his library um, in Soho Square. Um, so rearranging in, in some respects was relatively straightforward. Um, he, um, he was... He used to keep his um, records for specific activities together and in some cases even assigned a title page um, for that bundle of papers. Um, other, other, um, other parts were, were a challenge for our archivist. So the old website looked like this. It, it's practical. It's not fancy, um, but um, as I said at the time, it was it provided access to a collection fully digitised. It wasn't transcribed. Some parts were, but generally um, it wasn't transcribed. So when we searched, it was it's on the metadata that was embedded um, that was um, in the website. Now the website was on a standalone website, and it was a little bit difficult to find, um, and. Um, 
and the purpose of the website was to improve the intellectual access to this collection um, of a per, you know, significant personal archive. Um, so we realised that although this is fantastic, we're into the 21st century and we, we really needed to make an effort to improve um, access and discoverability of this significant collection. So with the support of our foundation and, um, and they found supporters for us, um, we, we gained sponsorship for, from the McLean Foundation, Dr. Timothy Pascoe, AM, Mrs. Pascoe, and um, the Key Foundation. So the objectives of our project essentially remained the same, but we also wanted to make it more engaging. Um, it had to be interactive, um, easy access, um, improved improve discoverability, of course, um, and we also wanted to be able to include um, enhanced reference tools um, as part of the website. Um, and it's, of course, a no-brainer that it's an opportunity to raise the profile of such a significant um, and large manuscript collection. Um, so we'd hope, we hope um, that the final product, we're halfway through the project, um, will result in um, the full transcripts being imported into the website, which, of course, will improve discoverability and searching. So the new website looks like this, and it's up, it's available. Um, you can see, aesthetically, it's a huge improvement. Um, now, there were two stages to this project. We've um, delivered stage one, which involved the delivery of the website, complete with um, re-digitising the whole archive in colour at a high resolution. Um, and um, we, one of the key points was having multiple access points, which, which it does, and I'll go into that in a little bit, um, a little bit later. Um, as you can see, we find it, it's far more aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Um, and a, a nice little treat that our developers wove in was that the colour of, um, of the text box with the adjacent picture has been um, harvested from somewhere in the picture that, that matches. So it's, it's not essential, but it's a nice little touch that they added in. Um, second stage of the project will involve full transcriptions of every single page in the archive um, and then um, all of that, the available metadata at the moment is exactly the same as it was in the old website. We have um, the title, creator, um, any notes and provenance details. All of that was in the original archive and uh, website and we felt that was important to, to continue using that but also provide extra searchability with full text. Um, so we digitised, redigitised the whole collection. Now that we received um, funding, initial funding from the um, Digital Excellence Program paid for that funding, um, and also that involved um, the upgrade of thousands and thousands of catalogue records, <laughs> because this is now catalogued down. This collection is now catalogued down to the item level, which is enormous. Um, an enormous achievement and involved the collaboration of a lot of teams at the State Library, our, um, our cataloguing team, our um, imaging services team um, and our digital excellence team which um, is our, our developers. So we've all worked very closely together to deliver even the project this far. So essentially we wanted to deliver a, an experience that mirrored using the archive um, physically. So um, we wanted people to be able to know where they were in the archive at any given time. Um, now that that can be difficult to, to represent, but with a collection of this size, we wanted people to know what series they're in, which document, what page, um, and I think we've delivered that. Um, in the planning stage, we worked with external developers, Holly. Um, we had to sit down and say, explain exactly what we wanted. And one of the more difficult parts was, was getting their heads around the structure of the archive and why that was important. We did entertain, is there some other way we can deliver this? Is, is the hierarchy important? And we felt it was. And all this work and um, you know, just from an archival principle, we should maintain that archive but we can then, on a website, provide access from other, other avenues. So the significant must-haves or, or um, things that were on our requirement list were improved usability, multiple access points, the ability to browse the hierarchy, keyword searching, um, 
all collect collection items had to link back to the catalogue. Um, the ability to deliver data sets, um, the navigation had to be intuitive, um, and the information, ar information architecture, usability and design had to be, um, we, we, ideally we wanted to reuse it, um, so use this as a template for our other major uh, manuscript collections, such as the Macquarie Papers and the Flinders Papers. So if we're going to put all, all this effort into this project, we want to be able to reuse it, and, and ultimately that's what we, we do hope to do. Um, so the designers came up with this elegant grid design and um, you can see, let me find my pointer. So you, under no illusion, exactly the stats of every single section is there for you to see just from the home page. So this has four series, 32 documents and 95 frames or, or pages. And do, do, do. So you can also drop down at this stage and every, everywhere you see one of these arrows is a drop down for further information or, or links somewhere else. Now, I should explain, just to keep on the safe side, I've just done screenshots, so we're working <laughs> from screenshots today. So it's a little bit clunky as I explain my screenshots, um, but it's a lot safer. So, so when you click through to the series, you can um, see the title um, and you can drill down. So, um, do, do, do. Again, drop down and see the, the titles of the documents or you can just click on the image and that will take you through to the next, the next level. Now, at the bottom of every series, you have the provenance notes and that's, it's really, um, for a researcher, that's where the contextual information comes in. So, um, in a lot of cases, that's the sort of information that some of our researchers are really after. Um, now... One of the design um, requirements was this use of, oops, this, um, an easy to use, um, clean menu box. So we have this navigational tool that floats at the side of every page um, and the, the icons that we've chosen are universal. Um, so we have the hamburger button or the menu at the top. So that, what that gets us is this, this list and it is a complete list from top to bottom of the whole archive. And we had a bit of pushback in the, in the project team and people saying, oh, why do we want that? Because sometimes people just want to scroll down and see the entire archive. Now, that you can do in the catalog, but it's a show more, show more, show more. And you can press that button 50,000 times. Where here, you can just scroll straight down. Now, it is quite, um, I mean, it's huge. So what you can do, the search button bar at the top is a filter by keyword. So it's just literally a filter of those, that top level title of each document, but it helps you to drill down if, if you've got a rough idea what you're after. So then the search button, um, let's keep on the side is a keyword search. And this is um, the results when I searched Arthur Phillips 1788. So there were 18 items um, that contain this term. Uh, the top item in the list, as you can see here, has, where are we, six, um, six frames, and you can see exactly where you are in the collection. Um, at this stage, it, there is only one collection, but ultimately you'll be able to, you'll know, you'll be able to search either within the, just the Joseph Banks papers, or you'll know if you're in the Wentworth papers or the um, Macquarie papers, what your section is and what your series is. Um, what is a particular, um, Oh, and the um, the share, that's just you, you, the ability to share your discoveries um, via Twitter, Facebook or Pinterest, um, which is a, a must-have in this digital age. So a particular feature that we were very excited about is this new idea of um, smart breadcrumbs at the top of the page. And that's these up here. And now... At any given time, you can navigate up and down um, sort of laterally or um, you can go through your sections or through your series, through your documents. And once you get down to the document level, you can skip through 
your pages. If it's like a 300 page, you can click on the book and enter the exact page that you know. And I think with an archive like this, once you get there, uh, you want to write that page number down and skip through to it, which I've, I've learned quite quickly. And that's, that's until we have our, um, our stage two our research tools, because once we get there, we'll have many more tools to be able to handle that sort of thing. Um, skip through. I think I'm, I've waffled. Um, so some of the challenges, um, obviously budget. I mean, that's everybody's challenge and, and resources. Um, this we ended up building. We went external for designers. They, they provided the wireframe and we um, our inside um, in-house designers built it. And there's pros and cons for that. At least um, along the way we can um, have things fixed, um, tweaked. As so to speak. Um, the project was heavily impacted by the fact that we were implementing a, um, uh, a number of library management systems at the same time for published, printed, uh, published and um, archival as well as uh, the discovery layer and a whole new website. So needless to say, you know, it, the project was heavily impacted on those sorts of things. Um, stage two, um, will involve the um, delivery of our transcripts. We have an in-house transcript tool, which we have been, for the last two years, um, our digital volunteers have been working like crazy to um, deliver this the, our transcripts. Now, I'm not going to go into the challenges associated with crowdsourcing um, your manuscript collections. There are so many pros and cons. Um, we, we considered all sorts of options, but the, we just didn't have the money to have professionals um, um, be transcribing this collection. On, on the flip side, um, you have people all around the world that are helping us get over the line with this project. Um, some of them are academics that have a passion for banks. Um, others are just uni students that um, have come to a talk that we've done or one of our transcribathons and got right into it. Obviously, it's 18th century hand and, and there are so many issues that go along with, with that. But when you weigh up um, the benefits and versus, you know, the odd, um, the odd document that has the, the wrong word written, um, all these things are surmountable at, at the end. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So I'll just skip through. Um, stage two, we'll load the transcripts and some of the research tools that we, we aim to deliver are a login so that you can create your own user profile. Um, and um, once you get there, you'll be able to make notes, save your notes, bookmark pages, um, highlight text. So they're all our, our wants, and we're hoping that, that, that that's deliverable in the next six to 12 months. Um, we're working with our digital um, team on, on these things. Um, there's just a, an example of a page in our, um, in our trans, transcript tool. Um, and you can see how they've transcribed, transcribed the page. At the moment, we're at about 93% complete, which is just blown my mind that we've achieved that in a, in a roughly two-year period. Now, that's not 93% already delivered. Um, there's still over 2,000 records that require um, review, and we have a, seri a, a team of on-site volunteers that are doing our review, and they're our gun transcribers that have been tr transcribing for the library for some of them 20 years. So, so we trust their judgment, um, but, you know, as with anything, it's all with a grain of salt, and, but, you know, nobody dies if we get it wrong. We can, we can go back and fix it. So I'll just end um, with a thought that I don't think um, Sir Joseph Banks could ever have anticipated that his archive would have been reimagined the way that we have. But I'm sure that he knew the value of his archive because he, people were using it even when he was alive. Um, and he was a fastidious record keeper. He was a scientist, so he would have wanted people to be continuing to use, use his research and and his archive for whatever purpose was beneficial to them. Um, I think he would have approved of us using 21st century technology to interrogate his collections. And I think that what we've delivered thus far certainly goes a long way to, um, to en enabling serendipitous discovery within this archive. So, thank you.